For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Because this matters. Because your soul matters. Yeah. This deception is so clever, so fantastically put together, that even some of the sharpest minds miss it. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. There's so many going for this. Do not be seduced by this end times religion that the Bible calls Jimmy Hummish. The whore of Mystery Babylon. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Oh, it makes me wonder. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Many people in these last days have been seduced into a off-brand of Christianity which is not Christianity at all. The Bible says that there is a spiritual seduction in the last day. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Everyone, when they speak of seduction, they always speak of it in a physical sense. But the truth is, there is a spiritual seduction that is just as real as any physical seduction. Oh, mystery. Oh, mystery. If we have tried to place you into a box, break it. No mold can hold you. And the problem with all of this is that it, it's something that's so attractive to so many people. And all you have to do to succumb to it is just simply not know the Bible. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. It is attractive. It is alluring, it is enticing. but it will ultimately lead to destruction. And there are many warnings in the Bible about, for she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Oh, it makes me wonder. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that our guests are in the depths of hell.
with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. The kind of power is almost impossible for a natural body to attain. Dear lady, can you hear me? Wind blow, and it should blow. I want to know the truth of black magic. Occult is a certain technology that you can use your energies to create certain impact. There's like a, an energy and a hum to the city. How it works, it's just don't see the lines, you know? It's just bringing us together instead of divide. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. So this crystal cylinder here is the sort of the eye. eye. Her house is the way to hell. Deception is real and it's so subtle and so cunning and so likable and so appealing that you'll go for it and as you're going for it you lose all sense of everything else around you. You lose all awareness of all the implications of what you're getting into. That is by definition the, the nature of seduction is that you forget what this is going to cost you. This is no joke. This is real. going down to the chambers of death. She'll say, division is our enemy. Let us all unite. It's time to put an end to this fuss and this fight. Then the walls will come down. There's no need to be divided. If we are all the same, why should we be so misguided? They will cast off first faith claiming freedom from legality. They will fall for the false love because they promised them liberality. The mother is ready, her wayward children to receive and their petty little doctrines they will forsake and leave. They will feel the glory as the music is played. The touch so powerful, their very souls they will trade. They will see the lights and swoon at this production. But like a lamb to the slaughter, they will embrace the great seduction.
What have I gotten into? What am I seeing? How did I go all of my life and never see this before? Now I understand why John marveled when he saw her. I read where the angel said, I will show thee the mystery of the woman. And I said, Lord, could you show me the mystery of the woman? And I think he has. And I'm shocked. How could that be in front of my face all of my life and I never saw it? Am I blind? How did I miss that? She's everywhere everywhere and I didn't even see her and the Bible says she seduces and that makes a lot of sense now I've asked God to show me some things let me see I want to understand the lay of the land of modern theology and out of the understanding that God gave me third Adam was born. But somehow I felt like it wasn't enough. I asked the Lord for a deeper understanding. And I cannot believe what I'm seeing. This goes all the way back to the beginning all the way back to the garden. It's bigger than one people group. It's bigger than any religion. It's everywhere and it's nowhere. And so no wonder upon her forehead is written mystery. In this video, we will show you what we believe that mystery is. This is something that once you see it, you can never unsee it. And beware, the knowledge that you're about to give, you will be called upon to obey, and you'll be accountable for what you hear. I implore you not to harden your heart against the truth you're about to receive. This will be both an edification and a dire warning. Your soul is at stake. This is not a game. This is serious. Show me the mystery of the woman. In my study of religion, I've come to the conclusion that there are not many religions in the world. There's only two. There's truth and there's error. And the Bible calls error many names, but one of the names it calls it is the mystery religion. And so I want to show you the difference between true religion and the mystery religion. Now, false doctrine and mystery religion is all the same in that it is very, very you see this in Hinduism, there's multiple gods. You see this even in Catholicism, there's multiple traditions. Just, there's literally volumes of stuff that you have to know. But Paul said that true religion was very simple to know and to get. 
But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Another thing that the Bible says about the mystery religion is that, is that it contradicts. And the reason it contradicts is because the source of it is someone who is out of line and contradictory to what God created him to be. But Bible doctrine and truth, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Another thing about false doctrine is that it always changes. It's like it's evolving constantly. But the truth about Bible doctrine is that it is, it's immutable, which means it never changes. It is consistent all the way through because God is consistent all the way through. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Another thing about this mystery religion that is declared in the Bible is that it's very confusing. It is not something very simple to understand. God's truth is easy to understand. James 3, 16, 17 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Another thing about mystery religion is that it is, it's concealed. It's something that's often done in private and in secret. That's why your secret societies won't tell you what they do behind closed doors. And by the way, the word, the word occult by its very definition means hidden. It's a secret religion. It's something that we don't just openly advertise this stuff. True religion is not to be concealed. True religion is to be declared to all the world. Ephesians 5 verse 11, 12 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, hidden, occultic, concealed, mystery religion. Another thing we need to take into consideration is that true religion always and false religion subverts men. Titus 1:10 and 11 says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. So truth converts, error subverts. Another thing about true religion that we have to know is that true religion saves men. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. But the mystery religion doesn't save men. The mystery religion does something completely different. And the Bible uses the word seduce. Mark 13, 22 says, For false Christ and false prophet shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Well, who are these people? It's that crowd. And it does all of that by design. Now to understand the mystery of religion, you have to go all the way back to the beginning to see what Satan was saying to Eve in the Garden of Eden. And so I want to give you the doctrine of the serpent. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. And so the very first thing that Satan did was was diminish the vision of God. Now in the book of Genesis chapter 2, God is called the Lord God almost every time. Now Satan comes along in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 and he just calls him and he diminishes 
the view that Eve had of God. You see this everywhere. People are diminishing who God is. He's not the high King of Kings and Lord of Lords anymore. He's just your homeboy. He's just, you know, the man upstairs. And that is satanic in nature because you're diminishing the vision of God and the view of God, who God is. You're not calling him the Lord God. You're just calling him just God. So, Jesus, <laughs> thank you so much that you're so much fun. Oh my gosh, God, it's awesome that you are not serious. Distort the voice of God. Satan has always been an enemy of what God actually said. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the problem with Satan is that Satan is the master of half-truths. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So it was a half-truth what he said, but Satan didn't give all that God said. Verse 17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so Satan is actually the very first out-of-context preacher in the Bible. That's been something Satan has done since the beginning, is take bits and pieces of what God said and twist them to his own liking. And you see this today with all these mega church pastors, these charismatic leaders that are out there. They have no context for what they're saying, and they're doing exactly what Satan did to Eve in Genesis 3.1. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And that's that's only a piece of what God said. Now here it's important to note that the very first word that Lucifer says in the Bible, canonically, is the word yea, which means that Satan is always trying to put a positive spin on certain aspects of God without giving you the whole counsel of God. And everybody's just got this idea that Satan is just over the top nasty and mean, and that's not who Satan is. Satan is a sweet, happy, smiley creature, and, and he's manipulating you with positivity. And you can always tell his ministers because his ministers never, never, never say anything negative about sin. They never say anything negative about hell. How would you explain God? to a non-believer. I would explain God as the creator, a heavenly father of someone that wants to be in relationship with you, just um, as somebody that's for you, as a friend. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. He dismissed the vengeance of God. God said, if you eat, you're going to die. Satan says, no, no, God's not going to punish you for your sin. I mean, you see this preached everywhere in many circles today. Rob Bell putting out a book about love wins, how everybody's going to go to heaven. Nobody's going to go to hell. Gandhi's in hell. He is. And someone knows this for sure and, and felt the need to let the rest of us know. Will only a few select people make it to heaven? And will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? And millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus, is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued from this God. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Decide to be void of God. But here's what Satan does. Here, here's the 21st century equivalent of that. You know, there's a whole world out there that you can enjoy, but you're bound by this church. You can be your own God, and God is holding you back from something. From creation to the flood, this doctrine basically prevailed. They had no use for God and they lived godlessly in this age and it was so unbelievably immoral and criminal, all the things that were happening in this era. Well, God steps in and he decides that I'm going to wipe the whole world out and that brings in Noah's flood. The only family alive is Noah and his three sons. Now, Ham had a son named Cush, which brought forth another son, 
named Nimrod. After Noah's flood, the entire ecosystem of the world was different. The firmament had changed and the behaviors of plants and animals had changed and so these men were basically the descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth were thrust into a world that they didn't understand and they basically had to start completely over and didn't know how to handle it. And so the world was a very tumultuous and dangerous place but in the midst of the turmoil there stepped forward a man named Nimrod and Nimrod, the Bible says he was a great hunter before the Lord which shows to me that he could protect these people from this crazy world that they lived in. And he became a king and he, he had cities and, and, and would pe put people behind walls to protect them. And he was able to teach them how to fight and be a warrior in that day and age. And, and so Nimrod became a king, but they didn't just stop there. They actually elevated him to a godlike status and actually started to worship the man. Now, one thing most people don't realize is we think in a Western sense that a tower is something like this, like a skyscraper and with windows and that kind of stuff. That's what we think of a tower is today. But that's not what that tower was in the Old Testament. The tower was not a skyscraper. The tower was a pyramid. Now after the flood, God said, just go across the world, multiply, and let's just start the world over. But the people met in a place called Shinar, and they decided, we don't want to be scattered across the earth. We want to meet here, and they ended up building the Tower of Babel. As you take the crown off and place it on the child, I see like a pyramid of crowns upon the child's head. Global unification. We're going to bring everybody together under one government together. God said to, to, to Noah, now you're off the ark. He builds an altar, yeah. offers a sacrifice, and God says, now I want you and your sons to scatter across the earth and wow. repopulate the world. But the Bible says in chapter 11, they went down into the Shinar Valley, mm -hmm. and a large group of them all said, lest we be scattered. Let us build mm. us a tower. Mm. Let us, let us, five times. Yeah. Wow. So they got them a leader by the name of Nimrod because you can't take such a mass undertaking mm. to build an edifice that was a yeah. defiance against God. And it says, lest we be scattered. So unity was their, their big keystone unity. of their religion. How it works, it's just don't see the lines, you know. It's just bringing us together instead of dividing us. Self-exaltation. And so this religion was formed where Nimrod, the God-man, the man standing in the place of God, is leading these people to do their own works to earn their way to heaven and build their own way to heaven and doing it together. And they were basically building what the occult world calls the stairway to heaven. Moral degradation. The Bible says there in verse number 6, And the Lord God said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. We have, we have tried, tried to, place to place you into, into a, box. a box. Break it. Break it. Break it. 
basically what they're saying is, you know, we're going to all get together and we're going to get to heaven on our own and we're going to live any way we want to while we're doing it. Now, if you take the doctrine of the serpent that started in the Garden of Eden and merge it with the doctrine of the tower, then you have the mystery religion. Now, one thing to note is that the doctrine of the serpent is the spiritual component and the doctrine of the tower is the physical. And this is the first and most pure form of paganism. And this did not go away in the book of Genesis. This mystery Babylonian religion is still alive and existing even in the church age. To understand now, you have to understand the past. You have Nimrod, who is the leader of the people of Babel, and he actually fell in love with a woman named Semiramis. Pagan history teaches that Semiramis was an arch-occultist, and she was a very seductive person, and so Nimrod fell for her and ended up marrying her. The problem was is that she was a harlot woman, and so what he did is he married her, made her the queen, declared her the Holy Virgin. Now, at this point is where most historians disagree and the timeline of all this is really fuzzy. Is that it contradicts. And the reason it contradicts is because the source of it. And so what I'm going to give you is what generally most people believe about what happened. Basically, what a lot of people believe is that Nimrod died. And Semiramis has to come up with some plan to keep control of the kingdom. And so what she says is, I am now with child immaculately of the reincarnation of Nimrod. And she has a child, and that child's name is Tammuz. And she actually had him on December 25th. And so now you have basically the pagan trinity. You have Nimrod, and Semiramis, and Tammuz. And Nimrod was declared to be the god of the sun. Semiramis was declared to be goddess of the moon. And Tammuz was declared to be the son of the stars. As this religion evolved over time, the emphasis was not placed on Nimrod, it was not placed on Tammuz. The emphasis was placed on Semiramis, the woman. And what Semiramis was declared to be was the... And Tammuz was declared to be... And she was declared to be the queen of heaven. You notice that the, the crown is on Mary's head. Okay, it, that's baby Jesus. But the crown's on Mary's head because she's the queen of heaven. And so all the worship pointed to the Holy Mother and the Divine Son. And she was given all the attention. At the Tower of Babel, God came down and confounded the languages of the world. And the religion of the mysteries of Babylon had already been established. They were practicing this. Uh, they were worshiping in this way. And God confounded the languages, which means that they had it all spread across the world. And so what happened is they took the religion and spread it all across the world. And it went with them. That's why you have pyramids in Egypt. You have pyramids in Sudan. You have pyramids in Bosnia. You have pyramids in Italy. And so basically this religion spread all across the world. With it, you see pyramids everywhere. You see pyramids in Mexico. And why is that? Because this ancient Babylonian religion 
the mystery religion, paganism, spread across the world at the confounding of the languages. And so everywhere you see in the world, they are basically just repeating Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Now when the Lord confounded the languages at the Tower of Babel, there in Genesis 11, all of these people spread across the world and they took that religion with them. You can see the evidence in the pyramid, but also they took the religion of the Holy Mother and the Divine Son, they took that with them too. And so as you study world history, you can see this religion popping up. Many people don't know this, but Buddha was actually born of a virgin. Her name was Maya. Then you go into India and stuff, you see that Isi and Iswari, and then you see Devaki, the mother of Krishna. And over in Asia, you have Xing Mu, the mother of the West. And then even in the Roman world, Sybil, and she had a son named Attis. Now people don't realize this about Islam, but if you look at the logo of Islam, it's a moon and a star. Where do you think they got that? The moon is a picture of Semiramis and the star is a picture of Tammuz. So you have the mother and the son in the same logo. It's, I mean, it's on their flag. And most people don't even see this, but it's everywhere. And if you look at the Egyptian Ankh, it's a cross with a circle on it. That's the same symbol for a female today. And guys, I hate to break it to you, but even the Statue of Liberty given to the United States by France is nothing more than a statue of Semiramis. Doing a layover in Paris on my way back from Kenya this next trip that I'm doing in April. There's a group of Christians there that have contacted me and said, we, we want to show you a few things when you come here. We're going to show you Notre Dame, and I'm going to show you that that was a temple to ISIS. It was. And they will, they actually just said, okay, now it's not ISIS, it's Mary. And so, and then they just built that right on top of it. Well, ISIS is just the name that came through Egypt hmm. out of the mysteries of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And ISIS was none other than Simranius, okay, which was the consortus of Nimrod. So in chapter 11, you find that the world's dispersed and everybody across the world is practicing this pagan Babylonian mysteries of Babylon religion. And in the midst of that, God calls a man named Abram to be his man and gives him a covenant. And so at this point, you basically have two religions in the world. You have Abraham's religion and then you have paganism. And Abraham's religion ended up becoming what we call today Bible-believing Christianity. And paganism ended up being many things. It was the gods of Egypt. And one of the names that the pagan Babylonian religion took was 
Baal worship. And this dichotomy between Abraham's God and Baal is prevalent throughout all of the Bible. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the descendants of Jacob go down into Egypt, and they end up being slaves for the Egyptian gods, which were the gods of Baal. And God raises up Moses and calls his people out of Egypt, out of paganism, and that's what God has always done. God is always leading his people out of paganism. And as he leads them out of Egypt, he tells them to go in camp by a place called Baal Zephon. And so Baal Zephon was a location that the pagan people of that day had dedicated in honor of Baal, thanking him for protection in the sea. And so the Lord told his people, go to Baal Zephon, and I'm going to show you who the real protector of the sea is. And it was at that location that the God of Abraham parted the Red Sea and actually drowned the people who were responsible for building Baal Zephon in the sea that day. Now, as I said before, this mystery religion takes on many different names, but it's still the same stuff. Leviticus 18.21 says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Chapter 4, verse 19, And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, that's Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Even all the hosts of heaven should thou be driven to worship them. And Israel bowed and shied them, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. These Moabitess people were worshipers of Semiramis, and they were seducing the people of Israel to give up their purity and come worship pagan gods with them. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites. Well, who do you think the god of the Amorites and the gods on the other side of the flood were? Well, that was the mystery of Babylon religion that started with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. You see in the book of Isaiah where they made the brick altars, and those were altars unto Baal. Now, one of the classic examples of this religion in the Old Testament is found in the vision of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter number 8. Ezekiel is taken up to a temple in heaven, and he sees Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis being worshipped in the temple of God. And brought me to the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door to integrate gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh the jealousy? That's Semiramis. In verse 14 he says, Then brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. This was paganism. Then in verse 16 you find that there's a group of men with their backs against the temple. The Bible says, and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun towards the east. That's the worship of Nimrod. So you have the unholy trinity in Ezekiel chapter 8. You have Semiramis, you have Tammuz, and you have Nimrod. This pagan religion seducing the people of God to come worship them. The people of God end up being seduced by Ashtoreth, which was the Canaanite version, the Canaanite name of Semiramis. And Jeremiah really had to deal with these people when he talked about the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Who do you think that was? That was the worship of the pagan goddess Semiramis. You're burning incense to the queen of heaven. And then he also says you're burning incense to the queen of heaven in verse number 18. Our Holy Father now sensing the paschal candle with incense, this will be the... Now if you fast forward a little ways to the book of Acts chapter 12, they talk about Easter. And Easter was a pagan festival that happened during the week of Christ's crucifixion. And it's not a mistranslation of the Bible. It's something that actually happened during the Passover where Christ was crucified. It's not that Passover was translated as Easter. It's just that they happened the same time that year. And that's just a fact of history. But Easter was a Roman festival to the goddess of Ishtar. God sent his angel Gabriel to Nazareth to speak with a young girl, Mary.
We call her Easter, but Ishtar is what they called her, and Ishtar is Semiramis. And Paul, in his missionary journeys, had to deal with the worshipers of this pagan goddess, and they called her Diana in Acts 19.28. When they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Diana was just another version of Semiramis. Now, in the New Testament church, the Corinthian church was warned about this paganism. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's Baal. And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, for you the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. First John 2.26, John wrote to the church, and he says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. That's this pagan woman worship. Revelation chapter 17 verse 4, you find that there is a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Do you see the same religion that was started in the beginning of the Bible? And Babylon is the same religion at the end of the Bible, the harlot religion. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carrieth her. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. And so you see, without any doubt, that this religion is woven all throughout the Bible. It's everywhere. Although it has taken many different forms and many different names, it's still the same religion, the mysteries of Babylon, the harlot woman religion. And this religion seduces the people of God and the people of this world to cast off morality, cast off the law of God, cast off all your differences. Come together as one big happy group. Let's all build a stairway to heaven together and make this world a better place. Let's exalt ourselves and better ourselves. Is this not the religion of the age? Is this not the mystery religion? Is this not what people are preaching everywhere across the world? This is what's seducing people. You can come and go to heaven, unite with everybody, and there's really no restraint on how you live. You can do whatever you want and still go to heaven. And it's a fleshly appeal, a satanic appeal. It is a seduction on a spiritual level that is taking so many people away from God. Now you may be watching this video and say, you know, this stuff you're talking about sounds very similar to Christianity, which is designed to be that way. Now if you understand the nature of Satan, in our first Third Adam video we did, we talked about how Satan's desire was to imitate God and infiltrate everything that God is doing. The two main tactics of Satan always have been and always will be imitation and infiltration of everything that God has and God does. And so everything God does, Satan has a counterfeit. Now the intellectual atheists love to point out the existence of Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz, and they use that to discredit Christianity. The truth is, yes, all false religions, if you follow them upstream, the fountainhead of all of those religions is Mystery Babylon. Genesis chapter 11 is where all of these false religions began. The only exceptions that do not have their foundation in Mystery Babylon are Christianity and Judaism. And so there's going to come a day where all of these religious people are going to realize what I'm telling you in this video, that yes, we all have the same source. Our advice is to make friends to followers of all religions. Maybe we're not that different after all. No matter from which side of the mountain you are climbing. No matter from which side of the mountain you are climbing. We should be helping each other so that we can all get to the same place. They're going to unite just like they did at the Tower of Babel. Well, and create another stairway to heaven. 
honor other religions like you do your own. And what Billy Graham did with ecumenicism is going to explode on a larger level into universalism. We need to get together and know one another just to discover and explore those uh, commonalities. And you can see this even now. One of the wonderful things about spending time with people completely unlike you is you discover how much you have in common. Where all the false religions are getting together and trying to find common ground in this day and age to find some way that they can get along and work together. So, so Rome doesn't recognize like Hindus as Christians or nothing like that? I don't think it's not that black and white any longer. Oh really? No. Okay. No. I... Do, you, do you believe all religions are basically the same? Is yes. that kind of your position on that? Yes. Okay. Everything is the same. The most wonderful. Now largely at this point, I don't think they realize what I'm telling you in this video is true, but there's going to come a day where they will learn this. And then they'll realize these whole divisions we have are ridiculous. We're basically the same thing. And they're not wrong when they say that because they are basically the same thing. They are a continuation of the doctrine of the serpent and the doctrine of tower merged together into the mysteries of Babylon. That is the end times religion. And all of these religions are basically that. Just another form, another type, another variation of the mysteries of Babylon. And so what does this have to do with modern Christianity? Well, it has a significant role to play in the future. This religion is always seeking to infiltrate Christianity and merge together. You see, God says be separate from the world. But the world and this mystery Babylon religion is always trying to merge and blend with everything. And it's trying to seduce Christianity to come and be with it. A classic example of this through history is the conversion of Constantine. Constantine saw the symbol in the sky, supposedly was converted, which I don't think he was. And he said, that's it. We're pagan Rome, but you know what? We're not going to be pagan Rome anymore. We're going to be Christian Rome. And that's where we get the term Roman Catholicism. They kept all of their pagan practices. They just gave it a new name. Instead of the gods they called at the time, they just said, okay, well now this is the Father, this is the Son, and this is the Holy Spirit and this is Mary and this mystery Babylon religion pretending to be Christianity persecuted real Christian believers and you see the paganism trying to infiltrate Christianity today through several avenues but one of them is the music they are taking the music of paganism changing the words so that it appeals to Christianity and saying, you know what, this is just Christian. And people who are Christians are being seduced into a mystery Babylon false worship because they're not discerning people. And the most dangerous form of the Mystery Babylon religion is Roman Catholicism. Here in Paris, France, and I want to show you a Catholic church that's here and show you all the things that are on and try to explain some of these images and, and some of the symbols that are on there. Of course, you got the saints that are up there on the top. And uh, let's, let's see if we can go on inside the building, see if we can do that. Like most of this religion points to Mary. Book of Jeremiah calls her the Queen of Heaven. Now it is, of course, time has changed it a lot and this religion is always changing. It always
always changes. It's like it's evolving constantly. It is one of the most significant forms of Mystery Babylon. They worship the Holy Mother and the Divine Son. Lady Gaga is a Catholic. That is just a modern form of Mystery Babylon worship. This woman, this seducing entity of Mystery Babylon, it was everywhere in the Old Testament. It was everywhere in the New Testament. Even in the book of Revelation, you see her as the woman that rides the beast. What makes you think that she's not in your church now? She was working then, she'll work in the future, and she's still alive right now, seducing the body of Christ to give up its chastity. To give up its purity. I'm gonna say this one thing and then I will leave it be. Is anyone in here into the Enneagram? Okay. To give up the very thing that makes it what it is, a holy people. as the bride of Christ. And I'm gonna show you how they're gonna do it. So back in the Middle Ages and through much of history, you have people that are basically being forced into paganism. And a group of people were involved in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages and say, you know what, this isn't scriptural, this isn't Bible. We're gonna come out and create our own church. And it was a great conflict, significant to history. It was called the Great Reformation. So basically you have the Catholic religion, and a bunch of people came out of this system. And so basically this is how it all played out. But a new entity has been born in these last days, and it's coming out of this crowd right here, and it's called the New Apostolic Reformation. Now what's happening today is that this religion wants all of her babies to come home and then this religion is going to merge with all the other religions and have your one world religion. And so if you notice the plan of God is always complete opposite of the plan of Satan. So let's take this chart and flip it on its head. Everything listed on the board here came out of the Catholic Church, but there's going to be a day where everything goes back into the Catholic Church. And this event that is happening now before your very eyes will be called the Great Reclamation. All of these denominations are going to unite together and eventually they're going to do a reverse reformation and they're all going to go back to Mother Rome again. Kind of free and unbound in the presence of God, or whether it looks like a Catholic service or an Anglican worship. Our Catholic brothers are with us. Tell us, Mateo, welcome. Give our shout of thanksgiving for our Catholic brothers. Go ahead. And the tool that will be used to accomplish this goal is going to be none other than the New Apostolic Reformation. It's going to be your Bethel. It's going to be Hillsong. It's going to be all these compromising new evangelical people. Now, most people would say, you know, Spencer, how in the world are all these denominations going to work with Roman Catholicism? How is that even possible? Well, if you look at their doctrinal statement on paper, it's not possible. It never has been possible. What is the thing that unites these people? It's going to have to be experience. And in order to unite around experience, you have to throw doctrine to the wind just for the sake of unity. They're all going to unite around a generic form of worship, worshiping a generic deity saying love, grace, hope, and it's going to be this soft, unconditional love, like a mother's love. I 
And the big one today that is happening now, that is going to be used to make this happen, the Passion Conference. So the Passion Conference happens every year in Atlanta, Georgia, and last year they filled up the Mercedes-Benz Stadium there where the Super Bowl was played. And I'm from Atlanta, so I've always paid attention to this kind of stuff. And Lou Giglio is the man who heads up this meeting. And the problem with these conferences is that it's a who's who of heresy of the day. And here's the lineup of speakers at the 2020 Passion Conference. You got Passion Worship. Crowder, whose church in Texas that he helped start, now marries homosexual couples. You have Christine Kane, a female evangelist out of Hillsong, Australia. Hillsong United, you got Levi Lusco, the pastor of Skull Church in Montana. You have Elevation Worship with Stephen Furtick. You have Andy Mineo, who, like Lauren Daigle, wants to be known for the music, but don't want to be called a Christian rapper or a Christian star. Then you got Sadie Robertson, who's a Campbellite Church of Christ Duck Dynasty kid. They believe that water baptism actually saves you. And then you have Oral Roberts University graduate Carrie Job with Lecrae. Then you have Sean Coran, Tripoli, Social Club Misfits. And then you have Tim Tebow, who he just met with the Pope this past year. Even the tweets that are being put out by this conference on their own Twitter page are promoting heretical doctrinal positions. January 2nd, 2019, there's divinity in your DNA. There's heaven inside of you. That's the little God's doctrine. That's charismatic New Apostolic Reformation stuff. If we can actually believe we were born of light, we were made of light, we were made of love. God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Decide to be void of God. You can be your own God. And so you have to understand the end of the road of all ecumenicism, it will always, always, always end up in the arms of the Mother Church. I feel like asking the Lord for the grace to always be trusting in this Mother who defends us, teaches us, helps us to grow. The worshiping Semiramis and Tammuz, except they call her Mary and Jesus. This end times assimilation of all denominations is going to happen. If you notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that God told the church of Corinth to come out from among them, that was the multiple pagan influences of that time. But in Revelation chapter number 18, it's singular, it's not plural. It's come out from among her. Because all of this is going to join together. All the pagan religions of the world, including this one, are going to join together as one. And the tool that will be used to bring all of these denominations together is going to be none other than the New Apostolic Reformation. This shift of unity into paganism is going to be marked by seducing spirits. And then there's Holy Spirit, and I view him like the genie from Aladdin. It was Holy Spirit. Kaya Danashua. Now I can feel, can you, you can feel the shift, right? Yeah, I was wondering if that was going to happen. Okay. Place that anointing that crown, that gift upon someone else's head. Legacy, legacy. As the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. Prophesy over them 10 times. Doctrinal dysfunction. A blue visible mist of God's glory comes into my guests' meetings. One meeting had 3,000 people came to Messiah and 25 death and people instantly healed. Are you ready for the blue mist? And he said, and I, I was immediately in heaven and the Lord showed me the angelic host about to be released. And I'm sitting there like. And moral mischief.
in so-called churches. It says, come out from among her. The Bible uses the word her, which is a feminine pronoun. A large portion of this movement back into paganism is going to be marked by feminine leadership. The international version says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make the woman to be an authority corresponding to him. God is a God of order, and He has ordered His church to be a certain way, and He wants there to be bishops and deacons. And He even gives the qualifications of a bishop in the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I want you to notice this. He says in verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And all the pronouns for a bishop in the New Testament are masculine. Could it be that the Lord has designed it to be this way because all pagan religions were led by females? Could it be that the Lord saw the worship of Semiramis and Tammuz throughout history and says, my New Testament church is going to be different. It's not going to be led by a woman and it's not going to be led to worship a woman. It's going to be led by a man to worship the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 2 to the church of Thyatira, God says this to them, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal in the Old Testament, the wife of Ahab. And what they're saying is, you are allowing a pagan woman into the local New Testament church to teach the people of God. And she is seducing the servants of God to commit fornication, to eat things, sacrifice to idols. So I wanna begin and end my talk today with um, a prayer from my first book, Glory Happening. If you're not comfortable with prayer, you can think of these as poems. As you're comfortable, you can listen and pray with me. Oh mystery, if we have tried to place you into a box, break it. Hidden, occultic, concealed, mystery, religion. This is what's happening today. This was even going on in the New Testament church back then. And it's still going on now. God doesn't have anything against women. I don't have anything against women. But the Bible clearly defines that the local New Testament church is to be pastored by a man. It's also going to be marked by feminine worship. And you can see it now. These people in this movement are actually worshiping a female God. I said, Lord, I promise you, if you send her the Holy Spirit back, I will not get in the way. I loved that he was portrayed as a female for the sense of, in the Bible, it always talks about how we're both made in his image, man and woman. And a lot of times, you know, because Jesus came as a man, or um, I, I guess I always think of God as a man. And I love, I don't know if this is a spoiler alert, but I loved in the movie where he said, I, well, it was the female, she said, God said, I had to come to you like this because that's what your heart needed at the time. He's not seducing, she is seducing. She reaches out and says, come to me, lest we be scattered. Global unification.
Over the course of this movie project that we've been doing, I've had many divine appointments. God has put people into my life that I, I'm so thankful for. One person contacted me from overseas and told me that they were a very high-ranking occultist and asked to remain anonymous. And this person made an outstanding claim to me. They said that the modern church has occult practices all in it, but most of them don't even see it. So I asked this person to compile a list of things that the modern churches are doing that is born in the occult. And I'm going to share this information with you now in this video. There are five words on the board that I want to go through. Witchcraft, divination, enchantments, Eastern mysticism, and necromancy. And I want to define all of these and give you an example of each one of these practices being done in the church. The first one is witchcraft. And witchcraft is the usage of spiritual power not given by God's Holy Spirit. You're using a spiritual power not given by God's Holy Spirit. An example of this is the Kundalini Spirit. And you see that manifest many different ways in churches today. But witchcraft is often heavily associated with symbolism. And the modern church today has no clue what they're even looking at when they look at a modern occult symbol. I challenge you to go look at how many pyramids are being shown in churches today. I mean, the main concert has pyramids all over it. Another example of this is the Enneagram, and this is very popular today. People are using it to tell their personality types and things like that. I never have done the Enneagram, but the Enneagram is an occultic symbol. You, you're, you're practicing witchcraft when you are using the Enneagram. The Book of Ceremonial Magic, including sorcery and necromancy. I mean, just let me just show you some of the stuff in this book. I mean, this is... This is the occult. And I don't know what number you are, and I don't care what number you are. You should not be using esoteric symbols to reveal truth about yourself. You are practicing witchcraft. If you just open up that Bible and start reading, God will give you plenty about yourself to last you a whole lifetime. You don't need some witchcraft symbol to show you your strengths and weaknesses. God's Word can do that plenty good without that. Another thing is the imagery that's on albums today. You can see it on Casting Crowns albums, the As Above, So Below symbol. And it's everywhere. And if you understand, the occult is something that basically means it's hidden. It's hidden in plain view. And you didn't see it, and I didn't see it for a long time either, but I think now is the time for you to open up your eyes and see. Another word that we have here is divination. It basically means fortune telling that I know something's about to happen. Uh, that is often associated with psychics and things like that. And it's very clever how it's matched today, but when a preacher gets up and says, God has something for you, there's a breakthrough about to happen in your life, there is something good coming down the way for you, that's nothing more than just divination in Jesus' name. That's all you're doing. The only foretelling you can do is what that Bible tells you is going to happen. That's the only thing you have. And so be careful of divination. Another word is enchantment. And the, the word enchantment means a hypnotic euphoria. Basically, if you're captivated by something, we use the word enchanted by that. And that is witchcraft. And when you're enchanted by something, you have like this inordinate affection towards it and you are possessed by that. And that's what enchantment is. One of the main ways that the occult world enchants people is through hypnosis. And the way they do that is by repeating things over and over and over again. And the modern church is practicing this with these shallow, repetitive, emotional songs 
that they just repeat the same phrase like a like God is good and God is good and God is good and they repeat that over and over and over again and you get some sort of spiritual euphoria from that well that's not the Holy Spirit that's witchcraft are not being blessed, you are being enchanted. And when I was a teenager, Baptist preachers would call those 7-Eleven songs, seven words repeated 11 times. And I do find it interesting that the first mention of the word enchantment in the Bible is Exodus chapter 7 verse 11. But that just may be a gigantic coincidence, and what do I know? I'm just a guy with the Bible here. Another example of this is necromancy. Faith healers do this all the time. They claim that they have the power to raise the dead, which that's what necromancy is. You are raising the dead. And the classic example of that uh, was the Wake Up Olive incident out there at Bethel Church in Redding, California in 2019. A young little girl died, and they spent five days praying for that child to be resurrected. That is necromancy. That's what they're doing. Praying and, and trying to seek spiritual power to raise a deceased human. That's necromancy. And lastly, the most prevalent one, in my opinion, is Eastern mysticism in the modern church. The only difference between the occult and Eastern mysticism is geography. Hinduism is nothing more than the occult in the Far East. That's all it is. An example of Eastern mysticism is people talk about karma, what goes around comes around. That's Eastern mystic talk. Modern martial arts is eat up with Eastern mysticism. Focusing your chi and finding your center. That's all Eastern mysticism. And the most prevalent one today, which I find it funny that most women are doing this, is yoga. There is far more to yoga than just exercise. Basically what you're doing is you're standing in these poses and you are making your body an antenna for spiritual demons to possess you. That is the purpose behind doing these poses. You are worshiping deities. And when you are doing these poses, you are actually acting out the Bahatma Gita stories. You're acting out demon gods fighting each other in ancient battles, and that's what you're doing. And so there's a spiritual element to that. And so these are the modern occult practices in everyday modern churches. And guys, it creeps in, it sneaks in, because this mystery religion thrives off of being hidden in plain view, creeping in unawares, as the Bible says. And if you have this stuff in your life, you need to get rid of it as soon as possible. Well, hello, friend. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Third Adam 2 took a lot of hours, a lot of research, and a lot of work to put all this together for you. But we know that it's going to be a blessing to somebody out there, and uh, we certainly did enjoy making that. You know, when I made the first Third Adam video, at the end of the video, I asked you three questions. I asked you if you're saved, if you're established, and if you're serving in a local church. And I think those are very important questions and I want to reiterate those, but I want to add a fourth one to that. And the question is, are you separated? You know, being saved is the most important thing that, that could ever happen to you. If you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, it really wasn't a good deal. And then also, are you established? Do you know why you believe what you believe? Because if you don't, 
then you're going to be ripe for deception in the end days. And the third question is, are you serving? Do you have a place that you serve God? Are you winning souls? Are you trying to tell people about Jesus? Try to tell people about the Word of God and the coming Christ? Are you doing that? And I think all of that is so very important. But I want to ask you a question. Are you separated from error? Are you separated from this harlot religion that is pretending to be Christianity? And Revelation 18 verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And we know that it is always God's will for His people to be separated unto Him. And for you to be separated unto Him, you will naturally be separated from false teaching and error. I want to share with you a very quick story. In January of 2020, before all the lockdowns happened, I was able to go to Kenya with a friend from our church and we had a layover in Amsterdam on the way back home. We met some missionary friends of mine and had a great time fellowshipping with them. We got there in the morning and ate breakfast with them. And I said, you know, would you please show me some sites around Amsterdam? And, and Amsterdam is known for its debauchery and it's, uh, <laughs> it is a very, very wicked place. But it does have some beautiful sites that I think are worth seeing. And so they showed us to a few sites. And I noticed as we were walking and just kind of exploring the city, uh, every now and then I would turn to go a certain way and he would, he would stop me and say, no, don't go down that way. Don't go down that road. And I'd look down the road, didn't look in any different than any other road that I was already going down and uh, he said, no, just don't go down that road. And every few minutes we'd take a turn and I would go one way and he'd say, no, don't go down that road. Don't go down that alley. And I thought, okay. And finally I just asked him, I said, man, wh what, is, what is the deal? What's, what's, what is in these alleyways? And he said, well, you got to be real sharp in your eye to spot it. But all of those red light districts are everywhere and I don't want you getting close to those. And I said, you know what? I, thank God that, that this man has been a friend to me. He is trying to keep me away from that. But you know what that missionary friend of mine was doing and trying to keep me away from that harlot area where all that was going on? I'm trying to do the same to you spiritually. You know, there is a whore of the book of Revelation. And it is a system that has been in existence since the Garden of Eden. And we went through and explained all that for you. But it has always been around. It's, it's been around ever since the Garden of Eden. And in the book of Revelation, God will finally be rid of it. But in the meantime, He tells you, stay away from her. Stay away from it. Stay away from this paganism that is pretending to be Christianity. Stay away from this seduction, this great seducing entity in the last day. And it is a spiritual seduction. Paul told Timothy in the last days, many shall give heed to seducing spirits. Well, where do you think those seducing spirits come from? I know where they come from. They come from that entity in Revelation chapter 17, the great whore. And she's around. It's a mystery religion. It's always changing. It's always hiding. And it's always trying to infiltrate. And I have prepared a graphic for you and I want you to see this and we'll, we'll let this be the end of the video. But I want you to see this, that this is, this is the harlot woman there on the left. And if you'll notice that I have placed the word mystery on her forehead and I have placed right near her the word death because that is where spiritual destruction happens across that line there. And uh, there's one line at the top that says orthodoxy and there's another line behind it that says obedience. Now, I want you to notice even below that it says neo-evangelicalism and then it says fundamentalism. And uh, a neo-evangelical and a fundamentalist are not the same. I consider myself a fundamentalist. Now, a neo-evangelical is one that although he will stand behind the wall of orthodoxy and he will hold to generally orthodox theological views, he will put himself in a position where he's seduced through music, through the beauty of false unity. He'll put himself in a place where he is seduced and allured and very well could succumb to that. The big one right now, as of the recording of this video, that it comes to my mind is Francis Chan. Francis Chan is fully embracing Roman Catholicism. Hillsong is in Phoenix, Arizona is now 
having conferences with Catholic priests. These people have seduced Francis Chan, a largely neo-evangelical guy, and he's being drug across that line of orthodoxy into death, spiritual death. And I don't know what the end of that road looks like for him, but I do fear for those who follow him, who will follow him across the line of orthodoxy into spiritual destruction. And folks, what I'm trying to encourage you today, it's not enough just to believe right. You have to not only believe right, but, but be in obedience to the truth, which means that you cannot hold hands with error. You just can't do it. I want to encourage you to put the same principle into practice in your spiritual life. Throw away your Hillsong CDs. Get as far away from that harlot as you possibly can. And by the way, that harlot, she's the one who gave you that music to begin with. And once she gets you hooked on that music, you're going to come crawling back for more. And that seducing spirit is going to be alluring to you. It's going to be reaching for you. And I don't even want to be in a place where I'm anywhere close to that. It's not about being holier than thou. It's not about an outward show of, I'm more spiritual than you. It's that I want to is that I want to be right with God and faithful to my Lord and Savior. And I cannot be faithful to my Lord and Savior and flirt with heretical, damnable heresy at the same time. I can't be faithful and be flirtatious with that. You can't do both. And so I'm calling for you to make a decision, ladies and gentlemen. I'm calling for you to choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to go flirt with the harlot religion the rest of your life? Or are you going to be the bride of Christ? What are you going to be? Well, I don't know about you, but I know as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And to serve the Lord, you got to step away from them old gods that you used to serve on the other side of the flood. And guys, I tell you what, I, the Lord has blessed our channel. And the Lord has blessed this making of this video and... And uh, we're excited about future possibilities there. But it's been exciting to see all the response that you guys have, have given to us and, and encouraged me, and I appreciate that. I want to encourage you to watch this video, and I know there's a lot of information in there. And I want you to share it with your friends and family and let the world know the truth about what the Bible says. There is a paganism out there that is deceitful, and it is luring people to receive a false gospel, receive a false Messiah, and it's going to cost them their very souls. And I don't want that for them. So help us with that, if you will. And guys, we love you. Please get out of these neo-evangelical churches. I'm not mad at neo-evangelical people, but I'm telling you, the neo-evangelical people like we have here on the screen, the neo-evangelical position is a whole lot closer to that harlot than I want to be. It's way too close. I want to be as far away behind the wall of obedience as I possibly can be where that seducing spirit, that long arm of seduction of that harlot religion, I want to be as far away from that as I possibly can. And guys, we love you so much. Thank you for watching this video. And if there's anything we can do for you, please feel free to let us know. God bless you, friend. We love you so much. And we'll see you again soon.